In this lecture, we're going to look at a specific type of force known as the frictional force, or simply friction. So before we get into what friction is, let's look at the following observation. Let's examine how one object interacts with a second object on a microscopic level. So let's choose our object number one to be the following eraser and object number two to be this box. And let's take our object number one and place it on top of object number two. And let's zoom in on the microscopic level and see how the surface of this object interacts with the surface of the box, our second object. So let's look at the following illustration. <coughs> Suppose this is our object number one, our eraser, and this is our object number two, the surface of our box. And let's zoom in on this cross-sectional area and let's zoom in all the way down to the microscopic subatomic, subatomic level. So, let's suppose this is our atom of the box and this is our atom of our eraser. So, how do these two atoms interact with one another? Well, notice that both nuclei are composed of protons. So, that means both nuclei are positively charged. Likewise, both guys have electrons surrounding or orbiting our nuclei. And that means that this plus charge on this nucleus will interact with this negative charge on this electron and, and they will form interactions. Likewise, this nucleus of the box interacts with this electron on the atoms in the eraser. And these guys also form interactions. And these interactions are called electrostatic interactions. So, when I place object number two, number one, my eraser, onto object number one, these guys interact and they form electrostatic interactions. So, once again, whenever an object is placed on a second object, on the surface of a second object, that object interacts with the surface of the second object on a microscopic level. The negatively charged electrons interact with the positively charged protons found in the nucleus to form electrostatic interactions. So let's look at the following experiment. Suppose we take our eraser and we take away the box and we let go of our eraser. What happens? Well, right now it's not moving, but as soon as I let go, it will begin traveling downward. It will begin accelerating downward because there is a force, force due to the gravity, that's pulling on it downward. So a net force creates an acceleration, so this eraser starts moving. But what happens when I place a barrier, such as this box, in between the ground and my eraser? What happens to my eraser? Well, my eraser does not move, and that's because the box is exerting an equal and opposite force pointing out um, upward, and this is called the normal force. And that's exactly why my eraser does not move, because there's a net force of zero. The two forces going up and down cancel out. But let's see what happens when I begin inclining my box. So let's say I incline it to an angle of 30 degrees. Say this is 30. What happens to my eraser? Well, nothing happens. But something should happen, right? Because when I increase my, uh, my angle, I create a component force, a component force of gravity that's pointing along the x-axis, along my incline. And this component force of gravity should technically uh, pull my eraser downward, but in fact it doesn't. And that means if my eraser does not move, that means there is a net force of zero. So there is some other force that's opposing my component force of gravity along the x direction, along the incline of the plane. And this component force that's opposing, that's pointing upward, is the force due to the electrostatic interactions. So the electrostatic interactions between the atoms of my eraser and the atoms of my box are binding, are bonding. And that means that they're creating forces and these forces are pointing in the opposite direction of uh, the gravitational force or component force pulling down the eraser. So at this point, our forces are exactly equal but in opposite directions. And that creates a net force of zero. Even if I go to say 60 degrees, uh, an angle of 60 degrees, 
my eraser still does not move. And that's because even at this angle, the two forces are still equal. However, eventually, if I increase my angle high enough, my eraser will begin moving. Look, even at an angle of 60 or maybe even 70, my eraser still does not move because there's, these interactions are so strong. But if I continue to increase my angle, my eraser begins moving and eventually it will begin moving because there is a net force acting on my eraser pointing along the incline of the box. And this force is due to gravity and at the point it starts moving, the force of gravity is... <coughs> The force of gravity is higher than the force due to these electrostatic interactions. And the force of these electrostatic interactions is known as the force of friction, or simply frictional forces. So once again, in the diagram above, a force known as force of gravity times sine theta, simply our component force along our incline or decline, acts on the eraser, pulling it down the incline. So this force pulls it down, yet the eraser does not move. This is because a force called static force or static friction is acting in the opposite direction of the force of gravity. So the reason this frictional force is known as static friction is because my object is not moving, right? As I increase my angle, my object is still not moving. And it's not moving because of this opposing uh, static friction force. So how do we find the magnitude of static friction? To find the magnitude, we have to use the far a following formula. So our static friction given by this curve Vf and a subscript S standing for static is less than or equal to our coefficient of static friction mu subscript S once again stands for static multiplied by the normal force of our object. So suppose we have the following system we have a rectangular box resting on the table. So what is our static friction? Well, notice that if no force is acting in either direction sideways, if no force is being applied this way, or no force is being applied this way, our static friction is zero. But as soon as I start applying a force, suppose I apply a very small force, to find the static friction force, I simply have to find the normal force, which in this case is simply m times g, so this is m times g, multiplied by the coefficient of static friction. And this will give me my normal force. Now, once again, in order to make a stationary object move, such as this box resting on this table, the force acting on that object, say a pushing force, must overcome the force of static friction. So the maximum force of static friction is F of S is equal to mu S multiplied by our normal force. So when I set these guys equal, I will get my maximum static force. And if the force with which I am pushing or pulling is less than my maximum static friction force, my object will not move. But if my force with which I am pushing or pulling is greater than the maximum static friction force, my object will begin to move. Now, when the object begins moving, a force must continually be applied. In other words, if, I, if this object begins moving, I have to continually push the object and let it move. If I stop pushing it, my object will stop moving. For example, suppose I have this eraser. Right now it's not moving, so there's a net force of zero on either direction. So suppose I push this er eraser hard enough to overcome the, sta <coughs> the static friction force, and it begins moving. Okay. So notice that if I push it lightly, it won't move because the static friction is larger than the force being applied. But if I apply a large enough force, my object will begin to move. And notice when I stop applying the force, my object stops moving. That means when the object is moving, there is another frictional force being applied to this object. And this frictional force is known as kinetic friction. Kinetic simply means movement of the object. So, once again, when the object begins moving, a force must continually be applied or added. If the force is removed, the object will stop due to 
another frictional force created by the motion of the object and this is called the kinetic friction and kinetic friction is given by the following formula where our kinetic friction now with a subscript k that stands for kinetic is equal to another coefficient mu k or the coefficient of kinetic friction multiplied by our normal force of the object this is different than this and the maximum static friction is always greater than this amount.